thank you so much for coming to CCTST Grand Rounds in celebration of March's Her Story Month. I always say it incorrectly, Her Story Month. So thank you, Dr. Jen O'Toole or Jennifer O'Toole. Uh, for joining us today and, and sharing your uh, national presentation on becoming an ally for gender equity in medicine. Um, just to introduce Jen, as uh, she is a member of our community um, at Children's and UC. So the former introduction here is Dr. F Dr. Jennifer O'Toole is a pediatric and adult hospitalist at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center and University of Cincinnati Medical Center and a professor of pediatrics and internal medicine at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. She holds a master's of, ed of education in curriculum and instruction from the University of Cincinnati College of Education. Since 2017, she has served as program director of Cincinnati's internal medicine and pediatrics residency program after having served as associate program director for nine years. In addition, she serves as program director of the MSTAR Medical Education Fellowship within the Department of Internal Medicine at UC College of Medicine. In July 2022, or 2022, Dr. O'Toole began her term as president-elect for the Medicine Pediatrics Program Directors Association and will serve the organization for four years. Dr. O'Toole has received the emergency, or excuse me, the emerging, emerging Leadership Award for an individual from the AAMC's Group on Women in Medicine and Science, the Society of Hospital Medicine's Award for Teaching Excellence in 2018, the inaugural MedPeds Program Director's Brendan P. Kelly Award in 2017, and the Cincinnati Children's Faculty Education Achievement Award in 2013. Her clinical and research interests include residency, education, curriculum development and innovation, handoff communication, patient family-centered care, and of course, achieving gender equity for women in medicine. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Jennifer O'Toole. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I, I, it's funny when you hear yourself being introduced because it's, it's a very embarrassing moment because really I feel like my biggest job is I'm trying to keep my three children alive most days. So um, I'm really glad to be here with all of you today to talk about uh, this topic that is truly near and dear to my heart, um, uh, especially when it comes to gender equity and how we can really elevate our allies to helping us achieve our mission of equity for all women and gender my minorities in medicine. So in terms of the disclosures, the only one I have is that I have served as a, consult a consultant and hold stock options for the IPAS Patient Safety Institute, um, a group that does a lot of patient safety work and is not at all pertaining to this uh, topic today. But here are our learning objectives. So by the end of today's session, I'm hoping that all of you will be able to describe the importance of allyship and achieving gender equity in medicine, discuss ways to expand your gender intelligence, develop a plan for how to become better public allies to promote awareness and action for gender equity in medicine. And then lastly, strategize how to stimulate organizational change for gender equity in the workplace. So here is our roadmap. So for what we're going to cover today, I'm gonna to start with talking uh, about why we are still talking about the topic of gender equity in medicine. Then we'll jump into what is allyship and why we need allies for women and and women of color in the workplace. We'll then go into some really practical tips on how to be a personal and public ally and some missteps to avoid for if you are an ally for gender equity. And then last but not least, how to create culture change for gender equity within your spheres of influence. And just some general housekeeping for today. So it looks like everyone is muted. Thank you for doing that. If you do feel comfortable and you're not in the middle of eating lunch or driving, feel free to turn your cameras on. It's always nice to look at faces versus a bunch of black boxes. We will ha we have the chat box open and live. So if you have comments or questions, please feel free to add them to the chat box. And then at the end of the talk, we will have some time for Q&A as well as some comments you may have. Uh, so that we can all share um, our experiences and ideas moving forward. I want to start all of this with a warning, because I know this can be a highly charged topic, 
And I, I, none of us are perfect. I'm not here today as, as the expert in anything. I am a learning al alongside all of you, but just to keep an open mind and an open heart as we have these discussions about allyship today. So why are we still talking about this? Why have we not achieved gender equity in medicine? And we know women have really come a long way. So from when Elizabeth Blackwell was the first woman in our country to graduate from medical school in 1849, followed shortly thereafter by uh, Rebecca Lee Crumpler, who in 1864 became the first black woman to graduate from medical school in our country. Women have achieved great success and have made great strides in terms of their presence and their leadership in, within medicine. However, when you look at the data, we know we are still struggling. And as a matter of fact, in 2017, that was the second time in history that we've actually achieved a tipping point where we had more women than men applying to and actually matriculating into medical school, which means this year will be the first year, or in 2021 was the first time we actually had more men than women graduating from medical school. So we have more men, women that are actually entering the medical workforce. However, despite all of these strides and more women matriculating into medical education, we know that it's still really hard for women to progress to the highest levels of leadership within medicine. They encounter both, both a glass ceiling as well as a sticky floor that really holds them back. For example, while women represent 41% of the faculty within academic medicine in our country, they only represent 29% of division chiefs, 25% of full professors, 18% of department chairs and 18% of deans in this country. So we still have a lot of work to do. And I do acknowledge this data um, is now three years old, but I'm sure that it will still, still probably look quite similar. And we have a lot of work to do to really help women achieve their fullest potential within medicine. Um, oops, this slide is supposed to be hidden. Ah. I am realizing that I, I'm gonna stop sharing. I have an old slide deck pulled up, which is incredibly embarrassing um, from another presentation, but I wanna, I wanna just change slides if everybody doesn't mind. Please excuse that. This is very, very embarrassing. <laughs> no worries. We're all not perfect. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, here we go. And you know what? I like that we can all be flexible and we can change yes. live while I'm talking here because why not? As I said, I'm not perfect either. That's There's right. Two copies of this pulled up. Um, and I also want to you to all recognize on this call that your department or your specialty is not immune uh, to seeing these barriers that women face. So if you look at any specialty that is out there, including in the field of research within medicine, women are still struggling to advance. Um, and there's a great piece that was actually put up by the NIH uh, back in 2021 that actually talked about how women are achieving external funding. And while women are obtaining fewer R01 initial tech grant funding, we do know that women, when they do get those initial grants, are obtaining more money, but still women represent a smaller proportion of the total grants that are given out by the NIH. And you see that across the board if you look at a number of funding mechanisms in our country. And even when you look at the state of what is going on here within our own College of Medicine, you will see that we still have poor representation of women in our highest sort of levels of leadership and our highest levels of rank in academic medicine. And this is data that I was actually on a, a group that we were looking at um, some of what is going on within the college. And this was part of the Improving Gender Equity in Medicine Initiative, the iGEM Initiative. Um, that has done a lot of work at really examining what is happening here within our own College of Medicine. And this data, which was uh, collected, and this is through the spring of 2022. So I do recognize that the data probably has evolved over the past year. This data also excludes the Department of Pediatrics, but for other fully appointed faculty, women represent 41% of our faculty, but only 29% of full professors, 31% of senior associate deans, 40% of associate deans, only 17% of chairs, 26 and 43% of vice or associate chairs, 29% of clinical program directors, 35% of graduate program directors, and only 13%
of Drake Award winners. And we all know that the Drake Medal is really our highest level of achievement within our College of Medicine. So if you look at this, and if I were to pull up the data from the, the national data from the AAMC, you would see that really what is going on here within our own College of Medicine really mir mirrors the national data. So despite all of this, we know, and there is good evidence that when teams within healthcare have women on those teams, they function at a higher level, they're more effective, and we also see better outcomes for patients. So we know it is important to make sure we have adequate gender diversity within our teams, whether they're administrative teams or patient care teams within medicine. So let's jump into talking about what is allyship and why this is so important if we're ever going to achieve gender equity in medicine. And I love this definition is I've, I've done a lot of research about uh, allyship over the years. I think this is probably the best and most encompassing definition. When a person of privilege works in solidarity and partnership with a marginalized group of people to help take down the systems that challenge the group's basic rights Equal, equal access and ability to thrive in our society. So that is what allyship is. It's those people that have the power, that have the privilege, working and standing alongside those that don't, helping them to achieve equity and justice within their sphere of influence. And allyship requires two different sets of building blocks when you think about how you actually do this effectively. The first is affirmation. So the individuals that are in the power or privilege position recognize that they are in that position and that because of that, they have an inequitable amount of right or power over others. It also, it also is very dependent upon personal relationships and listening and sometimes becoming invisible. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit about some tangible steps you can do to be a better ally within medicine but sometimes men have to actually take a step back and listen and become invisible for women to take that step forward. It also requires informed action. So public action, sponsorship of women, and lastly, advocacy to really lead that system and culture change within our institution. So allyship is not about saving women. I think this is sometimes what folks commonly think allyship consists of. Because really when you take that step forward to save or rescue or do something, often it reinforces that heroic or masculine stereotype and really does the it reinforces the status quo of the inequity we have in medicine. And if allies empathize humility and gender partnership, that is where we are really going to see that change. So again, I want to really highlight, it's not about rescuing, because I think a lot of men often will say, I have to go in and change something. I have to rescue the women. That's not what it is about. It is about sometimes taking that step back and really being a partner and a very silent and humble partner within that process. Here's a great example of the phases of allyship. And I, I love this because it talks about that continuum and that we all have the power to change in advance when we think about allyship. So for some individuals, they'll say, this is a problem for men that we're talking about allyship and towards gender equity. And there's others that will say, it's not a problem. It's all good. More women are entering the field of medicine. We are good. Over time, we will see the change. There's other individuals that will say, well, this is not my problem. I'm not a part of this. Like I do what I'm supposed to do. I, I don't really have to be a very vocal and visible ally. And then there's that step of, okay, I see there's a problem. I recognize there's inequity in medicine. I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to respond. And then there's the penultimate. And this is what we're looking to achieve with all of our um, colleagues that are men within medicine. I see the problem and I know what to do. I know how to respond. And I, I'm going to guess that most individuals on the call today are really living in a state of, I know there's a problem. You showed me the data, Jen. I know there's a problem. I see problems in my workplace sphere all of the time, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how to respond. I don't know how to create that culture change that is so important. So that's where we're gonna hopefully take that frame of reference today. I'm hoping that I can give you those tools to take forward into your workplace to be a more effective ally. 
So why do we need allies? Why is this important? Why are we talking about this topic? So men hold the majority of power positions and positions of influence within medicine. I showed you that data from the AAMC. I showed you our data from here within our College of Medicine. And women and those of non-binary identity cannot change the status quo alone. And often what happens in gender equity initiatives is, is women create this charge, they start being very vocal, they start doing different activities. Yet we know women cannot do it alone because they don't hold the power or the influence in a number of different circumstances. So men, and then we're gonna talk about how women also for women of color are really necessary to stimulate and advance change for equity in our workplaces. And it's also important to note that solving gender inequity should not be viewed as a zero sum game. And often individuals will say, well, if I sacrifice this, I have to give up for you to get something. So what we lose, you gain. But that is really not how we should be looking at it. We should, we should be looking at it from the point of the more we gain, the more we work towards equity, the bigger the, part, the size of the pie becomes for us each to get a slice of it. And I love this quote from a great book, and I'm actually going to give you this reference uh, at the end of the talk today, but gender inequities are not women's issues. They are leadership issues, and I want you to keep that in mind. So women, yes, can be part of the action, but really what we need is men. We need allies to really help us change the status quo. And as I said before, women also can be strong allies for each other. And this is often seen for women who are allies for women of color or non-binary individuals, because the inequities are even more profound for these individuals. Women in the majority should not, assume, should not assume their experiences are the same for women of color or non-binary individuals. And it's very important for those of us that are in um, the, that are women who have an advantage are also working for our colleagues that might um, face more disadvantages because of their color, their background, um, or their binary status. So I wanna make sure that I'm also talking to, I know there's a number of women on the call today. You also have to be strong allies for your other women colleagues. So let's talk about some practical tips to be a personal and public ally in the workplace. And I know this is really important and probably why everybody came to this call today. What can I actually do and influence in my personal interactions and in my, my own uh, sphere of influence within my workplace? So the first thing is to expand your gender intelligence, your GQ, and really what this entails is opening your eyes to what is happening in your workplace. Taking that step back and looking at the patterns, the behaviors that are happening within your environment. And what I encourage men to do in order to really develop their GQ is to you know, take a step back. Who's in the room? Who's sitting at the table? If you have all men, sitting at the table and women sitting on the outskirts. Who looks comfortable? Who's speaking the most? Who's not speaking a lot? Who's being really quiet? What's the mood in the room? Who's getting interrupted? Whose input is being solicited? Taking that step back, you will notice the inequities that happen within the meetings you attend, um, within the work you're doing. There are a lot of natural inequities that happen just the way we gather and communicate within our workplace environments. Next is dropping your gynophobia. So what is gynophobia? So it is the abnormal fear of women, which causes men to react in counterproductive ways. And while the Me Too movement, I think, has really helped gender equity to move great strides in our country, I think it has made men fearful. Often they're like, I don't want to be accused of anything, so I'm going to take this step back and I'm not going to interact with women. I'm not going to mentor women. I'm not going to sponsor women. I just don't even want to get in there, so I'm accused of anything. And really, that is counterintuitive and counterproductive to what we really want men to do. So obviously, we don't want, <laughs> harassment is never good in any situation. We also don't want men to ignore women, especially as a leader that really deliberately initiating conversations, mentoring opportunities, and lastly, sponsoring opportunities are really critical. Um, so I, I wanna encourage all of the men on the call today, don't be afraid, you know, have these conversations with women, learn more. Don't be afraid of mentoring and sponsoring 
Um, Because I really think that is the only way we're going to move things forward. If men are willing to be humble and really take that step back and listen to women within the workplaces and teams on which they function. I think also this extends to asking women about their experiencing. Because if you don't understand another individual's path in their career, their experiences, it's really hard to create change. So I always encourage men to sit down and ask women about what is their experiences. Let them know why you're doing it, that you really want to build your gender awareness. But when you do that, make sure you're listening more than you're talking. Don't interrogate, don't make excuses, just listen. And some great ways to do this, some great questions you can even start to um, begin those conversations. Is there one thing you wish men who work here would be more aware of? And what would that be? Or is there something men could do, stop doing or do more of within the workplace to make it a more gender equitable experience? And you'll be shocked at what you hear. And when I've seen men do this, it's just about stopping and listening and really learning about the experience of a woman. And I think we do this in a lot of different spheres of our lives, right? We do this with our patients. We do this with our colleagues. We do this with patient, you know, individuals coming from different backgrounds or races or orientation. So this is a skill that really, I think, is um, applicable across the board in lots of different um, arenas. And then also validating and normalizing a woman's experience. Um, you know, believe her, honoring her perceptions and experiences and normalizing her experiences and validating that prejudice and discrimination. You know, I think we've all probably, um, as women have been told at some point in our lives, or our careers, like, oh, don't worry about that. That happens all the time. Or that's the norm with this person or this group. Well, we shouldn't be making that norm. We should be calling it out and saying, that is not normal and really working then to change that experience or that environment in which the women are functioning. And also let women know if there are individuals who are experiences that are toxic. In addition to calling those individuals or experiences out, give women the inside scoops so they will know how to deal with those situations or those uh, individuals with difficult to encounter personalities. And then lastly, reframing emotion as passion. Um, I know I can be a very passionate person who can get upset, who can get angry. Um, When I see injustice, I want to work to change it. And often I have been told in my career and in my personal um, uh, life, well, stop being so emotional. Stop getting so upset about something. Um, And that is really not about emotion. That's around passion. So making sure you're reframing that when you see that. Um, or encouraging others to do that. If you see someone say, oh, they're just emotional or they always get upset. How can a man actually call that out and actually change that mindset we have of our women who have that passion? Owning and strategically using your privilege. So every man and every white woman on this call today has an invisible cape, which you carry with you that allows you privilege within society. Um, For men, it allows you privilege within male-centric workplaces. So you have to recognize that privilege you carry and be open-minded in accepting your own privilege, accepting how it gives you advantage over women or women of color who don't have that same invisible cape that they're carrying with them. And recognizing allyship is not about you. So when you do these efforts, it is not about making you look better. It is about really changing the workplace. It's done in a very silent and very humble manner. And, you know, often it may require relinquishing some of your your power privilege to stimulate change. Um, And I've seen this happen in lots of different venues venues where men take a step back. Like, I don't want to be in charge of that. Or I don't want to step into this position. I want to elevate a woman into that position. Um, Calling out inequities. Um, And a great example of this, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, is when men say, you know, I'm not going to be on that panel here for a local conference or at a national meeting because it's all men on that panel. I don't want to be a part of that. So find someone else, find a woman, find a, a, a person of color to be a part of that panel before you select me to do it. And really, lastly, giving up that spotlight. You know, if there's an opportunity for some uh, publicity around a project or research you're doing, who's being elevated? Is it the the man on the team or is it a woman on a team? 
And sometimes for men, it may, it may entail taking that step back and allowing your colleagues that are women or women of color to take uh, the, you know, take the limelight that is so important for advancing one's career. And also, when you see sexist words or phrases, be able to identify them and step in and intervene. So some types of language that you might see that you want to call out are non-inclusive or patronizing language. So, hey guys, hey girls, man up. I know I'm guilty of it. I think it's part of my lingo that I always say, hey guys, when I'm talking to a group of individuals and I've tried to be really cognizant about not using that as a term that is part of my vernacular. And then also recognizing discriminatory comments that play on stereotypes or rigid gender roles. So what are you girls gossiping about? I think you're being overly sensitive to that subject. All of those really perpetuate a lot of the discrimination we see towards women in medicine. And then obviously there's just misogyny that happens within our workplaces. When someone says, hey, you're really grouchy. Is it your time of the month? Um, that's really nice, but I'd like to see what your colleague or boss has to say about that. And often that colleague or a boss is a man. So recognizing when those types of situations occur is really critical. And then last but not least, recognizing benevolent sexism within our workplaces and the teams in which we function. So you might hear someone say, she's nice, but she's not really leadership material or We'd love to invite you to be a part of this, but we didn't invite you because we know it's in the evening hours and you have kids and it'll be tough to find a babysitter. All, that is a really exclusionary practice that happens to a lot of women within the workplace. And then if you see something, how do you say something? Because really men, you are the watchdogs out there for when we see this gender discrimination. And it's important for women to call it out, but it's also really important for men to call it out when it is occurring. So um, this book, Better Allies for Women in the Workplace, really great book, which I'll give you the reference to later, talks about using the two second rule to avoid bystander paralysis. So as soon as you see it within two seconds, shutting down the sexist humor, gossip or comments with responses like, ooh, not cool, or ouch, or I don't get it, can you explain that joke to me? Um, or even just saying, that's a terrible stereotype. You probably should not be saying that. And you might be guilty of saying some of these things and that's okay. And that's why I put the disclaimer at the start that none of us are perfect. We are all growing within this space of equity for all of the individuals we work with and live with every day. But when you say something, own it. It might be hard. Say you're sorry, show some humility and vulnerability in the process and then grow from there. You know, really set a practice moving forward where you're not going to use those types of terms. And then it's important to also be strategic about when you confront other men. So really framing that feedback as a growth opportunity. Because I know sometimes when you call out individuals, they become very defensive and that behavior becomes worse. So thinking about the right time and place um, to do that feedback and also frame it in a growth opportunity. None of us are perfect. We are all working to get better. And then just say no. So this is when I was talking before about mantles. So just say no to mantles, mansplaining, man spaces, man interruptions. And here's the examples of them up here. So I think pretty much the term mantles pretty universal. So these are non-diverse all male conference panels. It can be at a conference locally or nationally. Mansplaining when a man uh, typically has to explain something to a woman in a condescending or patronizing manner. Um, man spaces, so settings such as meeting where men, meetings where men assume they have a seat at the table, they'll be able to speak up. Um, they won't be interrupt, interrupted and they'll assume full credit. And then the classic man interruption, um, when a man will interrupt someone, a woman who is speaking um, and really showing disrespect and a disregard for her perspective, her opinion and her value. So really, recognizing those, making sure you're not practicing them, and then trying to call them out when they do occur. Disrupting office housework. So this is a one that is actually a big pet peeve of mine that I think happens to all of us. So what is office housework? So this is that administrative work, such as taking notes, bringing refreshments, planning the office holiday party, or 
uh, this being on the sunshine committee for a group that is necessary. And I'm not saying this, this type of work is not critically important to the supportive cultures in which we all work, but often it's undervalued. It doesn't lead to promotion or protected time. And sadly, it's disproportionately often assigned to women. So I want you to pay attention to that within your office, within your group division or department, who's doing the office housework? Is it women or is it men? And if it tends to be a lot of women, which I'm here to say probably will be, and that's what often happens, can it be redistributed to other men within the group? And I think this is this is so powerful and women do this and it's undervalued. And like I said, it doesn't lead to advancement. And we really have to make sure it is equitably distributed amongst all genders within our workspaces. Meetings. Meetings can be really tough and precarious for women. And that really comes down to being aware of what is going on in the meeting. So again, I want you, next time you go to a meeting, pay attention to what's happening. Be aware of the seating. Who's sitting at the table? Who's sitting on the outskirts? If you're on a video like a Zoom, who's got their uh, video turned on because they have the luxury to be able to do that within what they're doing? Um, ridicate risk to, risk to women in the meeting setting. So if it's going to be a really high, high stress or um, high ticket discussion, have those pre-meetings with women, huddle with them before, give them tips about handle, handling the discussions or what is going to happen there. Also, employ strategies to ensure women's voices are heard. Um, and there's a great article out there that you can um, read. It's in the lay press about the women who are on Barack Obama's can, uh, cabinet, that they would actually work to amplify what each other was saying. So often what happens is a woman would say something really high impact or have a really great idea, and the group would be going on and on and on and just sort of move forward. Other women bandaged together to say, you know what? So and such as opinion or idea was really great. Let's stop and talk about that, or let's think about employing that suggestion. Um, so I think that is a great way. That amplification technique is a great way to really ensure women's voices are heard in meetings. Call out her expertise. You know, say, "I know you're an expert in this," or "This is your um, area, your niche area that you really know better than anyone out, out uh, at this table." Call it out highlight the expertise that women have. Interrupt man interruptions. And I've seen this done a lot. I see actually a number of men and women and non-binary individuals across our academic center who do this really well that will say, hey, so-and-such, you just interrupted that individual. Let's go back to them. So doing that in a professional way that ensures that women have their voices heard in meetings. Again, amplifying her voice, her comments, her suggestions is so critical. And then be sure to call out when women are given office housework. And this happens in many meetings, like who's gonna put together the minutes? Who's gonna do that follow-up email? Who's gonna make that call? Is it evenly distributed? And if it's not, can we redistribute it so that women aren't being taxed with all of the office housework? housework? And then encourage women to let her talent shine and make sure you're sponsoring women. And I hope everyone on this call has heard of sponsorship, but just in case you haven't, I know we always talk about mentorship, but sponsorship is such a key element of advancement within academic medicine. And sponsorship occurs when a woman who has power or when a individual who has power and influence uses that power and influence for the advancement in, of another by nominating them for something, encouraging someone to take them into a position or role, speaking up on their behalf. And they really sort of put their social capital on the line on behalf of that individual they're sponsoring. And we know within academic medicine, women are often over mentored and under sponsored. So sponsor is really critical for women if we are going to achieve gender equity within our workplace. So how can you do this? you know, touting a woman's abilities and achievements when new projects are discussed, or you're looking for someone to lead a project that might lead, lead to another leadership role or another big opportunity. This is when, you know, talking up the women you work with is so critical. Nominate, nominate, nominate. I can't say this enough. Nominating women for awards, 
speaking engagements, positions, things that will help them advance up the academic ladder or advance into leadership roles is so critical. And I know one of my, um, my New Year's resolutions actually last year was every time I see an award that comes across my email or my desk, whether it's for a local award or a national award, I wanted to make sure I was nominating a woman colleague for every single one of those awards. That doesn't mean I wasn't all, all, also nominating my colleagues that are men, but I wanted to make sure I was making a vested interest to always nominate women for an award when it came, comes across my email. Because we all know that those awards are really critical as a component to your advancement within academic medicine. And then lastly, introducing women to a key player in a professional network. We all know that having that network is so critical when it comes to advancement. And those are networks both locally and nationally. So go out of your way to network women with other people you know that could help lead to future opportunities for their career advancement. And really, allyship starts at home. So for all individuals on this call, I really want you to think about how can you be a better ally within your home sphere? So being a domestic ally, helping with household tasks, doing more of that day-to-day -day scheduling that women often do. And we know women tend to work that second and third shift. It has definitely been amplified by the pandemic. So thinking about how you can step in to do those tasks those tasks that women are often tasked to do within the home environment. And then listening and checking in with your partner. How are they doing? How are you feeling? Are you feeling overwhelmed? Can I help by doing some additional tasks? And then when you do take time away from work, make sure you're leaving loudly. And I applaud all of my colleagues that are men who do this. Um, when they say, I cannot come to the meeting or I cannot do that call because I have something to do within my home environment or with my children. Um, and when you do that, proclaiming it, proclaiming it loudly and publicly. So when individuals take paternity leave, men take paternity leave, I love that because that helps normalize the practice and really makes it okay for women to do that. And I know I've, I've taken leaves to have children and I always felt like, oh my God, I'm gonna be behind. What am I gonna do to keep up? I still gotta stay on my email. I don't wanna lose anything. But now that I know that my colleagues that are men are doing the same thing, it really helps to normalize that behavior. You know, the things that I felt shy about 16 years ago that are really part of, becoming part of our normal culture. And I want to applaud both UC and Children's Hospital for doing this. We finally have paternity policies. There's a lot of work to do on them, but we finally have those on both sides of the street. And I think that has been so helpful to women when they are taking leave to have adopt or um, children or to care for family members. And then lastly, supporting your partner's career without reservation and making sure you create that flexible strategy to maximize both of your careers. Because I think it's really hard to have that career success when you're at work if you're not getting that support from your, your partner at home. So thinking about how you can do that effectively. And you know what? Missteps are inevitable. You will all make mistakes. I still make mistakes and I live in the, the world of gender equity, but maintaining a growth mindset and a sense of humility will really help you exceed, succeed. And don't be afraid when you make that mistake. Ask women, how can I do better? Ask your peers, your colleagues, how can I do better in this area when I really try to work towards gender equity within medicine? And I love this quote. So if it were easy, we wouldn't be talking about it. Allyship requires us to enter spaces and conversations that make us feel uncomfortable and occasional and take the occasional misstep. You're going to falter. That is okay. But what really matters is how you recover and having a growth mindset towards improvement within the equity sphere. Some other missteps to avoid that I want everyone to think about is don't step back when things become uncomfortable or challenging. And you are not here to save women. They don't, women don't need to be saved. What we need is for people to break down those century long systems of inequity that exist or the cultures or practices that have been, you know, generations long. We need people to call that out. We don't need to be saved. 
And then lastly, speaking more than you listen. I think is so critical for men to learn how to become better allies for women. So let's move in for a, out of the personal sphere into how you can become an advocate for systemic change. Because we recognize there are things you can do personally and within your everyday interactions with women. But also we have to all be working towards systemic change because that's when we're really going to see the difference uh, for gender equity with, for, in medicine. So you might all be thinking like, oh yeah, systemic culture change, that's gonna be really easy. We all know that's hard. We know changing cultures and what we do within a system or within a hospital or within a university or college often can be really challenging. But what I want to encourage is anybody on here, and I think all of us hold some type of leadership role, make allyship part of your brand and become a systemic change agent. So tout it, talk about being an ally, show that you're doing work to creating a more equitable workplace for women. And even if you're not in a leadership role, you can help really stimulate systemic change. Um, all of us have some type of invisible cape. So for the men on here, for the white women, you have that cape. So think about, even if you're not in a leadership position, you still can help be part of that change and lead efforts. And then lastly, for all of us that are in leadership roles, and I'm counting myself in that group too, you must hold yourself accountable and hold your organization accountable for creating change that really leads towards gender equity. So I always say within, within my residency, it is really important for me to walk the walk and talk the talk when it comes to gender equity. And I do it loudly. So my residents see me doing it. They see me doing things at home. They see me doing things in the workplace that are really promoting gender equity. And I think, and then I hold myself accountable. You know, part of my personal annual goals every year is what am I doing within my sphere of influence, which is namely my residency program to help promote gender equity. And I make that part of my goals every year that I have to be account accountable for being part of the change when it comes to equity within my um, workplace. And purposely using your influence is so important. Um, so again, men, you hold that special cape of power. Use that power, use that influence to call out disparities when you see them. Role model allyship in all that you do. So people should be watching you. Do it loudly. Let people know how you are being an ally for gender equity. And also don't be afraid to admit when you make a mistake. We're all gonna make those mistakes. Having that growth mindset is so critical, critical, but we have to really recognize that we're all going to falter at points in this journey to gender equity. Um, and then walk the walk and show up at events. I wanna give a shout out to every man on this call today. Thank you for coming to join us. You are doing that. You are showing us that you are committed to this topic. Often when we have talks about gender equity, who's in the room? lots of women. And I always challenge to say the people we need in the room are not the women. We need men in the room because they hold the power and influence. They are really going to help us create change. So shout out to all of the men that are on the call today or all the men that'll be watching it asynchronously after, since I know it's a very busy Friday for many. And then transparency. And I think this is an absolute key element to achieving gender equity within, the medic, uh, within medicine. So we need organizations that are being transparent, all different sorts of metrics. So earlier today, I presented some data on what's going on within our own college of medicine. So we have to transparently display data on rank, leadership and promotion within our hospitals and within our universities and colleges. Also being transparent about recruitment and position opening. Um, you know, if we want women to actually move into leadership positions, to move up ladders um, in academic medicine, we have to make sure they know about those openings and they want to apply for those openings. So thinking about how you can encourage women to apply for these positions is so critical. Also, publicly disclosing policies and practices on gender, race, and sexual orientation, making sure it is out there and everyone knows what are the policies, what do we believe in, what is our mission and vision as a university and how we're going to do that is so critical. And then be transparent about your equity initiatives that are happening is so important. 
let people know publicly put those out there so individuals know that it's very important for your organization to be doing this work. And then last but not least, salary equity, which I know is a huge, huge topic within the gender equity space is that we need to be very transparent about salaries. What are our norms within different specialties or different types of work uh, roles or practices? And then ensuring that we work towards achieving that salary equity. So when leaders see differences in salary, we have to work towards practices that where we are getting women up to those equitable salary rates. Um, and then also thinking about when women are applying for positions, how do we ensure they get an equitable opportunity towards what other men would get if they were applying for the position? I'm gonna talk about how we be very transparent around if you can negotiate around salary or not. Um, and there's lots of good evidence out there for a lot of specialties. And I'm thinking of one of my primary specialties, which is pediatrics, that women make less than men, which a few thousand dollars in one year, yes, is a big loss. But when you couple that um, difference in salary over the period of 10 or 20 years, that could lead to hundreds of thousands of dollars of salary loss for women over time. And we know that it's really important for women to be making that same equitable salary. Um, so again, pay equity, how to get it right. So really being transparent in hiring and sal salary criteria from the, the start of when someone takes a position. Um, and I know some institutions, I'm thinking of my own division here at Children's, everybody starts at the same salary. There's no ability to sort of jockey for differences in salary. Because what we know is that women are not great about negotiating for salary. And if they have that opportunity to negotiate, being very clear and transparent in job advertisements that women know they can um, negotiate around salary so that no one's put in that unfair position. And then making sure we're conducting at least annual reviews to look at pay equity. And if we see inequities, that we are bumping those individuals up to make sure they're in an equitable scale for other individuals that are doing the same work that they are doing um, within our different departments, divisions, and institutions. Supporting flexible work and leave policies. So again, I wanna just give a shout out to both the College of Medicine and Cincinnati Children's for really making some good strides in this area over the past few decades. But thinking about, um, it's important to have these policies, not just for women, but also for men and non-binary individuals. So it's not just for birthing parents, it's for parents that may be adopting or fostering children. Um, that is so critical because it makes it an equitable process. It normalizes taking those leaves for women that are taking them. So, and again, thinking about not just the birthing of a child, but also adoption, fostering, um, other elements that might go into having children. And then also having really clear established exit and reentry policy. So if someone goes on a leave, what is the expectation there? What about when they come back? How much, you know, are they expected to do work when they're away or are they not at all? And being very clear and upfront about those um, uh, practices. And then lastly, ensuring leaves don't impact promotion or advancement. And I know there's many institutions across the country we are not one of them that there's that clock that is ticking towards promotion or tenure. And if you don't reach it, you know, you're know you going to struggle there on moving forward. Um, but making sure that when someone takes leaves, they're not going to be put set back as compared to their peers who might not be taking that leave. And then organizational and leadership accountability. So this is the most powerful factor in really stimulating change. Since we know that if you attach gender diversity initiatives and metrics to the assessment of leaders, they're going to take it seriously. So making sure our leaders are being held accountable and there's, and that I'm including leaders at every level within our institution. So linking it to salary, to bonuses, to advancement, to annual reviews is so important. Because again, when it's linked to things that have value, people will actually take it seriously and do this critical equity work that we need to see. And then also creating policies that ensure equitable representation of women. So making sure when you have panels or you're hosting a conference 
or you're sending folks to different conferences, that they're not supporting manuals or inequitable um, presenters or plenary speakers, what have you. Mandating that women are part of those, mandating that women are part of search committees um, or evaluation committees is so critical. And one thing that you will see out there, if you actually look on um, recruitment of women for leadership positions, they always talk about the get two in the pool effect. That if we know if there's a position that is open, um, if you have one woman amongst a group of men, the likelihood she's going to get that position is pretty much zero. If you can at least get two in the pool, and we show that example here with two women and two men, there's a 50% chance that women will be hired because they will see that sort of normalization of having women candidates within the pool. And then the more women you can get into the pool, the better, the light, more likelihood that we will see that a woman will take the position. Um, and I know often when it comes to gender equity work, there's a lot of discussion around the pipeline. You know, there's just not enough women that will go into this. There's not enough women applying for something. And I think we can turn that around and say to our search committees and our leaders, you've got to find a woman. It's not a pipeline issue. There are women who, women who are skilled and who can do these roles. We just have to go find them. And we have to make sure that the applicant pool we are looking at has a strong representation of women, at least two women, because we know you got to get two in the pool. And making sure we extend that diversity and representation to everything we do. So not just about our own workforce, but thinking about our suppliers, our customers, anybody we interact with, are they doing the same diversity practices that we are upholding ourselves to is really important. So I'm gonna wrap things up and then we'll leave some time for Q and A, but where do we go from here? So how do we really create change? What are you all going to do with some of the information I presented today? So I want you all to pledge. I can't see pretty much anyone besides Stephanie, but I want you to raise your right hand. I want you to promise that you are going to do one thing differently to become a better ally. And for men, what you can do to be a better ally for women, women on this call, what you can do to become a better ally for the women that you work with. And I want you, you don't have to do it right now, but after the end of this talk, I want you to text that pledge to a significant other or a colleague that you work with. That's going to be your accountability buddy. So I want you to promise you're going to do one thing. It could be, I'm not going to be on a mantle. It could be, I'm going to call out when a man's planning occurs. Whatever it is, I want you to text that to someone who can hold you accountable to see that it's actually achieved. Um, and I kept referencing two really great books um, by Dr. Brad Johnson and Dr. Dave Smith. Um, many of you might have seen Dr. Brad Johnson when he was very, here as our WIMS, Cincinnati Children's WIMS visiting professor uh, last spring, but two really, really great books and great books, whether regardless of your gender identity to read. The first one is Good Guys, How Men Can Be Better Allies for Women in Workplace. And then if he's seen arising, how and why women should, or men should mentor women. Two really, really great reads that I have to say have given me a lot of great tips on how I can be a better ally and a better mentor. So I strongly encourage you to, to purchase and read both of these books. So there are my references. So I am gonna open things up to questions. I'm actually gonna pull up the chat, unless you see anything that's come up. Um, no, we don't have any questions no? in the chat, just okay. uh, some comments. Um, but I would I would encourage anyone who wants to ask a question or um, just reflect on this. I agree with Heather Christensen, this brilliant um, uh, presentation uh, to either raise their hand, open up their mic um, or add to the chat at this point. I think everybody's dashing to other meetings. Yes. Or that, they're just really shy on this Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> it is all good. Melanie, thank you so much. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself or would you like me to read it? Oh, I'm happy to unmute. Um, Great. As, as a newer, younger faculty member, um, <laughs> how would you encourage them to advocate within departments, divisions that are well-established and dynamics yes. that are well-established. Yes, yes. And that's hard, right? Because there's there's um, a political risk to being sure. that person who's saying that. So 
I would say the first thing I would really recommend doing is finding some allies. Um, and that includes allies that are more senior. They can be women, men, or non-binary individuals, but those folks who are going to help you in the process, because I think it is always more meaningful when you do this with another person, especially if that person has some additional political capital or influence. Um, and I think you'll be surprised at what you find um, at folks who recognize that and just didn't think about it or didn't think to speak up on an issue there. Um, so I think that's the first one is find, find your allies within your division, department, institute, whatever you're in here. I think also um, joining groups that are doing work in this area. So obviously we have WIMS groups, both at UC and at Children's that are doing work in this area. So reaching out to those individuals to say, hey, is there any ongoing work? Is there any effort or any other initiatives I can join? Um, and then I think also, talking with your, your boss, your supervisor, your division director, whoever might be that person you report to, to feel out like, what do they think about these issues? Because I think often folks may just not see it as an issue. They might just be sort of immune to it with where they are in their role. Um, but asking them, you know, what is going on? What's the situation? Have you noticed this before? Um, and doing it in a way that's not gonna put that person on a fence but really creating that open, safe conversation because they might have some strategies, techniques, um, or the political power or influence to actually help change what you're seeing that's ongoing. But it's, I, I do wanna say, Melanie, it is really, can be really risky. Um, and that's why I think looking for people who can create some safety um, and have that political clout or capital to speak up um, can really help give you that strength that you need to call things out. Thank you. Awesome. Any other last minute questions, feedback? If no one else have, has a question, I can have another one. Good, Melanie. Go for it, <laughs> Go for it Melanie. So, and partially I'm asking because I just took on a, a director role in DEI initiatives in our department. So awesome. I'm very interested and, and partially trying to figure out how do you find funding for initiatives around diversity and equity? <laughs> oh, Lord, that's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I think we all, no matter what, what institution we're coming from, money is always a big thing, right? And that's how you actually get things done is when you have money and power. Right. Um, I, I think there are folks who can talk to that are doing the work, um, whether it is, um, you know, I know here at Children's, we have a faculty DEI group that is doing a lot of work and initiatives and has the money to do that. Talking to your division director, your department or whatever, Mm -hmm. group you're in talking to the person in leadership to see if they have any money they can put towards this because I think often we there's little pockets of money maybe you can get a hold of um this is a tough one right because I often in equity work we do not put enough resources around it it is work that is done on a Saturday night in someone's free time using you know toothpicks and duct tape I always say <laughs> and we have to really make these well-funded, well-resourced initiatives to really move the, the dial. And I, I find, you know, here at our academic health center, our, our leaders are interested in doing this work. This is important work from top down. People recognize equity work, including gender equity work is so critical. Mm -hmm. They just may not have the time or bandwidth to do it. And if you're willing to do that work, often they can find you the power and resources you need. Thank you. Either that or we're all having a bake sale in the lobby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's going to fix everything, right? Excellent. Well, we're at the hour. Thank you so much, Jen. You're welcome. Um, for, you know, again, your brilliance, but your humor as well. Um, you have to have both.